I am Tom McGuire with Brew Mines here at Fig Leaf. We've got Jesse Folk behind the camera, the man in the computer. And I'm here with Andy and Jeff from Fig Leaf. What are your guys' roles and titles here at Fig Leaf? I'm more on the distribution side of things. I'm Jeff Horty, I'm the head brewer. Um, so we are here to talk about your first anniversary party, which is happening next weekend, October 14th? That's correct. Yep. And it runs from uh, 12 p.m. when you guys open until... Midnight, whenever we push people out the door. Midnight. <laughs> midnight at, least, at least midnight. At least yeah, midnight definitely. until we'll see. the last customer stumbles out into yeah. an Uber or a cop car. From the two, pretty much. Oh, um, so this is your first anniversary. Um, you guys have a couple special beers coming back um, and a couple new beers. So you got the, the Frankenhop, right? Yeah, it's a cuvee of a couple different portions of a couple different IPAs, re-fermented on some raspberries, um, just kind of an experiment, we'll, we'll see. Did you choose raspberries because you know I fucking love raspberries? <laughs> Not for that, yes, I fucking yes, love yes, that's exactly yes. why they were chosen. Good answer, good answer, yes. <laughs> um, and you've also got a new uh, Belgian quad? Belgian quad, uh, re-fermented on plum puree, uh, about pound per gallon is a significant amount. I just, I just want to say plum is a vastly underused fruit in, in beer, and I applaud your use, one, of doing a quad, which is one of my favorite beers, and two, adding plum to that. So And plum really go great quads. I mean, they, you know, you get some plum The yeast selection on the quad, too, is it's, uh, an Abbey style. It's kind of known for giving plummy sort of flavors, so hopefully... You know, so it's like double plum. Yep. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Like, we'll see how it but they should be working together, not against each other. And so that's gonna be like 10, 11 percent? Uh, a little bit over 10 percent. So definitely a four ounce pour on that one for me, as I'll be here all day, <laughs> right? That's your choice. <laughs> Are there any other new beers coming out besides the quad and the Frankenhop? I'm trying to remember what else we've got. That's it as far as the okay. brand new beers. Well, yeah. it looks like uh, on your tapping list, which we have out right now, you've got the Basmati, the Pride of Sunday, the F2, the Isotrope, a Waste Timer, the Inculpatory, which I am drinking right now and is incredibly tasty. It is. Um, the Ace of Brunus, your best yeah. beer, Ponderous, Little Amp. You guys have quite quite the list built up here. Frankenhop, Dark Side of the Sun, Black Solstice, Harvest Lager, Saison Blanc, also one of my favorites. Um, Sous La Table. Um, you guys are doing all the Belgian. You're just uh, rocking me out. Um, Belgian Quad and Exculpatory. And so a lot of those haven't been seen for a while. Like the Imperial Stout and the Sousa Top, are those new batches, or are they original batches that have been sitting around, or...? Those are the original batches. Library yeah. kegs from... Library kegs, I like that, that's a good term. So yeah. like the Sousa Top is what, five, four months old, six months old? I don't remember. It was in January, so... Oh wow, so that's almost, yeah, nine months there. And then the Stout, right? It was December. December, yeah, so that's a nice... You know, nine month old stout already. Yeah, and Sumatabo was like, what, nine point, over nine percent. Yeah, yeah, nine percent. It's yeah. been a while. We haven't had it for a while. Right. And the stout was also, you know, right at ten percent. And then, of course, like the cream ale and the waste timer, those are new batches, of right? Course, that's not like, you yes. don't have like a six month old. Ice true of all those stuff. Yeah, those are all, all, new, all that's fresh. Batch. And of course, yeah. Inculpatory is brand new, brand new. Uh, a week yep. ago, two weeks ago, was uh, it? Last week. week. Yeah. Last week, yeah. I drank too many of them, so I have no idea what day it was anymore. It's very easy to drink too many of them. They're delicious to drink. And what is it, nine? Nine point nine. Nine, yeah, but yeah, just under ten. But four of them's too many on a Thursday night, unfortunately. Um, so those are all the special beers you're gonna have on top. Is there any timed tapping that you've announced yet or are aware of? Not announced yet. yet. I'm still oh. figuring out the strategy. It if that even makes sense, to what extent we'll do it. So be sure to check their Facebook page. If there's one beer that you're really after, that you want to be here for, check their Facebook page for when time it's come out. Be sure to like and follow them and, and uh, you know, mark yourself as going to the event on Facebook so you'll know exactly what's happening when. And now you've got uh, three different bands or singers all day? We do. Noon to ten, we'll have three bands here. Okay, and then uh, you've got... A couple food trucks, two food trucks. Two food trucks all day as well. So, uh, 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 Carvasos yep. and the short ass food bus. That's right. Short ass food truck or something. We'll go with that. One of the two. I forget it's a food truck or food bus, anyways. I do want to say if you follow Brew Minds on Instagram or Twitter, you have seen Carvasos because I fucking love Carvasos. And you should definitely plan on coming out here having a few beers and eating Carvasos because it is amazing. I want to give those guys 
a little bit more love than I do, and I do appreciate that they hook me up every time, although I had way too much food last Thursday night, and it did not, was not enough to balance out all the inculpatories. Still pretty drunk when I took water. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of love, I have a quick question to you guys about, uh, about your anniversary. What would you say is the biggest thing that you have uh, learned in your first year of being a brewer? Biggest thing we've learned, man. One thing? I think we've learned a lot, but don't trust Google Maps if you're driving a big rig. I mean, <laughs> that's got to be good. Because you might get wedged under a bridge somewhere in Claremont County. That happens. <laughs> Yes, yes. I got out. I got out. No cops around, but next I got out. Next day shipping doesn't always mean the next day arrival. No, no. When you're new to the fig rig and distribution, I'm talking about behind. ingredients yeah. coming in the door. Yeah. <laughs> next day is shipping, but it doesn't ship for three days. Yeah. Yes. True. Beware of the month of December. <laughs> oh, yeah, Pardon me just yeah, one second. True. I have to go turn off the hot liquor tank. It's absolutely true. Okay. Got it overflowing. So it's been a full year, right? Yeah, next week will be a full year. Um, what has that been like? It's been absolutely crazy. Well, I mean, I, I can't believe it's been a year because we were so busy every single day that time has seemed like it's flown by. Because uh, something comes up every day uh, that you have to manage. I mean, it's like um, I'm not used to be an owner of a business, uh, so it's a whole new world to me um, and to everyone else that owns a business too. I'm like, just trying to. to into those roles so it's been it's been a whirlwind honestly of just kind of learning things so now are you excited for this anniversary party are you oh nervous? my gosh yes or no i'm not nervous are you guys going to be, be working party. it or are you going to be here and get shit we will be here or... all day long getting yes. shit yeah. so i'll probably you think drink that anyways but... <laughs> no <laughs> yeah no i'll probably be drinking coffee most of the half the day just keep going yeah yeah uh, so what are you most excited about for the beers that are either new or back on tap that you haven't had in a while? I'm really excited to try you know, Belgian Quad on Plums in its final fully ready to go form. Yeah. I'm also interested to try like Ace of Brunus, who's a yeah. hard maple aged uh, Northern English brown ale. So I'm curious to see, check in on that one and see how it's doing. And as well as the stout. You know. Some of these beers that were pulled out of the library literally we haven't had them on tap for a while. Yeah. They've just been sitting in your cooler, chilling, waiting. You're, you're resisting to touch them and let them sit there for a while longer. Exactly. Now, did you have this plan from the get-go? Like, when you made the stat, were you like, these three kegs are anniversary party kegs? Yes. Well, library yeah. with, a right. pretty library. Strong, with a pretty strong, you know, that's, I mean, things can come up. Like, oh, there's an event. We need to pull out something from the, you know. So you try to have a small collection of that stuff to draw from, but really, anniversary was the, the primary motivation for a lot of that. Now, are there more of these library kegs that will show up in another year, or...? I'm trying to build, you know, continue to build it for, as we move forward, there's not a ton beyond what we're releasing for. You guys don't have a tremendous amount of space. I mean, space is limited to some extent. So. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, all right, so again, it's uh, October 14th. Yep. 12 p.m. until 12 a.m. ish, maybe sometime around there. Um, what is it like? 17, 18 beers on tap. Jesse rattled off earlier. Yep, we've got them uh, all up on the screen right now. And uh, I, again, that is quite an impressive tap list. For, you know, for your guys' first one, especially throwing in like all those, you know, the triples and uh, all the Belgian beers. Because that I know for a fact it takes you know, a longer time to kind of turn in the tank. So hats off to you guys to be able to, you know, get that get that around. Um, I would have one last question before we uh, transition over to uh, our next topic. Uh, what are some uh, words of wisdom for you guys uh, to have to the breweries who have just started? We've just had like four or five open up in the past two weeks or so. Low, um, 16 low, and and works. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, you guys, I, I, it's kind of a very interesting model with, with the size of the equipment that you have and then your location, which is something we'll talk on later in the show. Um, you have a lot that I think you could teach some of the other guys, so uh, are there any things that you would uh, kind of I, I would point say, out? I would say we're still learning. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and that's maybe the answer, right? Like, uh, try to know yourself, know what you're good at, know your strengths, know where, where you need you know additional help. But like, Never stop learning. Yeah, never, yeah, be prepared to change the plan because the world is changing underneath our feet. And so, uh, 
craft beer is different here locally especially, but like in general, way different than it was a year ago, three years ago, five years ago. And so uh, Andy, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if it was before we did the restart or whatever, but like, you know, like five years ago is when we first put pen to paper, starting to even like try to formalize a business plan. Right. And so any plan that you write, by the time it actually gets able to be enacted, the world is a different place. And so right. be so prepared to mo modify and change and adapt. And There's a quote, I, I forget if it was Patton or Napoleon or something, but like no battle plans arise first contact with the enemy. Right. Yeah. And I know it's yeah. not necessarily your enemy, but still the same kind of thing. Right, and I think it's true for all these the, the breweries that we feel is uh, new to the area. They've obviously probably been planning for several years, you know, two or three years at least, uh, and are they're coming into uh, a kind of a little bit different world um, than it was five years ago, definitely, or even when they started writing their business plan. Well, speaking of coming to the new new world, uh, we can kind of transition over to our next topic. And a big point of news for you guys is that you signed with uh, Cavalier pretty early on, especially when you guys were doing um, your own self-distribution there for a while. I think uh, you told us earlier that uh, you were doing uh, eight counties uh, kind of on your own, and then now you're with Cavalier, one of the, the biggest uh, craft brewer distribution arms. So what, what that, what's that experience been like for you guys? So we're still really new to it. We're, what, maybe four or five weeks in. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely a different world. We're still trying to uh, adjust and adapt and you know because you go from being you know it's all on you to your one piece of a very very deep and respectable book right and so uh, that's a that's a very different world to exist in um, I think we're extremely happy to be with Cavalier um, because they have such you know they have, they've demonstrated over time and history well, if you look at their book they have a lot of the very Dr. very Shed, yeah Cantillon Matry, Jack Matry, yeah. yeah, like so. I mean, they they have an artifact. Yeah, and, and yeah, that's yeah, just yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's just craft. They have world class uh, import as well, and so it's very august company to be a part of, and we're very excited to be a very small piece of that. I actually have a, a direct follow up question to that. I was just talking to a uh, sales distributor uh, yesterday about this, and he was talking about how. Some breweries kind of feel like envy or a little bit of distrust when a, when a distributor brings on another account. But he said it actually should be the opposite of that. That if anything, it makes your standing at the bar or wherever you're being distributed actually stronger. Because if a, a distributor only has like a small portfolio, uh, they only could only bring so much to the table. Then they're not going to like get the turnover or get the taps that. You know they uh, that they would get if they had like a larger portfolio that you know someone might bring you on in Middletown and say well we're gonna we're gonna sign with, with you guys because we love fig leaf and um, well okay if, you, if we had to bring you on then we'll also put on you know uh, you know urban artifact and then vice versa down in Cincinnati it's like well we want urban artifact but well we're gonna get you this tap handle of uh, fig leaf as well so does that kind of jive with the way that you guys think about it or and do, you, do you think that there's you know, a lot of benefit for signing with a distributor? I think one of the, the benefits of doing self-distribution first was that we kind of laid, at least in the, the counties that we were in, a little bit of groundwork already. Um, so if anything, um, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think that if Cavalier already had handles at that location and we had a fig leaf candle, that's kind of another additional handle for Cavalier. Uh, but they would also now be reordering on those handles. Um, so, yeah. And of course, it's easy for those stores because they have one person to order with and one check to pay. They pay Cavalier those, one big check instead of definitely. paying Cavalier yes. a big check and you a smaller check. Right. And even we've heard that from our sales team that, you know, it's like with with several of these breweries out there, you have one beer buyer at a restaurant or, or an account, and they have a line basically waiting for them to get up there for their one specific beer. Um, and so yeah, that's definitely. And so when you guys first opened, did you distribute from day one or week one or month one or? Yeah, I'd say like a week or two in, we started self-distributing. Okay, and so then you just signed with Cavalier a month ago. So you self-distributed yeah. for nine or 10 months there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what has the difference been like? You said you were in the distribution side of things, right. and for, for both yourself and for the salespeople, what's it been like between self-distribution and Cavalier for, for the month that it's been? 
for the month it's been. <laughs> <laughs> for all four weeks. For all four weeks. <laughs> right. How's school. that going all four weeks? Depending on the month, um, that's not quite a month. but <laughs> Right. For September, that's a longer month. Right? Yeah, it's definitely been a, a different transition because week in, week out, um, we kind of know the cadence of how we run things um, as far as our sales team or our self-distribution team. And some of that's kind of been handed off to Cavalier, like, hey, these accounts that we used to see on a weekly basis uh, or every other week or whatever now are, are kind of in their hands on some of these areas um, because obviously our territory expanded from around eight counties up to 22. So some of these areas, obviously, we had never even been in uh, before. So some of that, that's been a little bit of, of change. Um, One definite positive advantage to signing with a distributor when you're a small but, you know, ambitious brewery is you bring to bear all of their resources, including, you know, their small army of people. Like, sure. You know, right. Yeah. Any brewery, if you're small, you, there's a, you know, a finite amount of people you could employ. Right. Um, at least, you know, at that stage of things. If you have a distributor, you have now you know, you, that many more potential conversations out in the field any given day, week, month. Right. You right. guys can't keep track of the local beer opening on the east side of Hamilton, the local bar opening on the east side of Hamilton, whereas the Cavalier rep has probably already been in there with the hard hat walking into construction zone saying, hey, I'm from Cavalier, you need guys need to have fig leaf on tap. When we first <clears throat> were meeting with Cavalier, they brought in, it was like 40 sales reps. It was every, wow. every sales rep, every territory manager, and state sales manager, it was like 40 people. I thought there was like, you know, like seven or eight people coming. They showed up en masse. It's like, oh, well, here's who we are here. Drink some beers, you know, and so you get to leverage all those people, hopefully, you know, in addition to all the other bre excellent breweries that they're representing, also mentioning us, you know, as a part of that conversation. I think uh, one last question we'd have about distribution is that uh, another, I think, interesting fact about you guys is that you went pretty quickly into um, canning. And I'm curious kind of what, what pushed that um, discussion. Is that like, uh, I don't know exactly how many weeks it was before you guys uh, opened up with the canning, but it seemed fairly quick from what I had seen from other breweries. So I was curious, what led you to uh, get into packaging so quickly in addition to, to your keg sales? I think we would have done it from day one if it was a realistic possibility, but when you're trying to get open, I mean, you've got a billion things to see about. And, Literally, that's just a whole other layer of complication. I was sort of an advocate of, like, let's hold on that for a second. Although it'd be great from a sales and marketing point of view to, like, hit the ground running with all these packages, but, like, you're learning a brand new system, there's logistics, it's, there's a billion things that have to come together. And so holding off on that for at least for a minute makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then I think Rotation Nation and... Yeah, I think from day one, we've actually talked about, it was like almost in our first year plan that we're going to be almost, we're going to try to almost the first year be all draft kind of get our, our beers dialed in, but also see what kind of, we, we brew a variety of styles, see what kind of the market dictates to us, what do they want to see in cans, what kind of rises to the top. Um, end up being our Basmati Cream Ale and Ice Trope IPA ended up being so two far. of the top ones so far. And, and the waste time, um, right? And waste time, when we did that, we just went straight to camp with that. Yeah, never, like, brewed, <laughs> never brewed it before. We're like, you know what? But it, it's camp. an American Pilsner, so you correct. Know, I mean, yeah. it's like the Because right at the dog day of the summer in August, so. let's just go straight to camp. Let's do it. Right. Um, yeah. Um, uh, brain hurt. <laughs> so, um, editing. <laughs> well, I think at this point, um, in addition to your distribution, like you guys are kind of set up in a very interesting location, in that you can you, you can pitch to not just the Cincinnati market, which we're kind of mostly beholden to, but you're also closely entwined with with the Dayton market. So we've been, especially with Tom living up in these areas. We've been very interested to see like how that has played out for you guys. I love living up in these areas. Like I'm some kind of woodland <laughs> wildly north of the wall, which is absolutely correct in something I do. So I was gonna say you brought that entirely on yourself. I, I think I was one of the first person I knew to refer to 275 as the wall and being north of it. So I was not I the first person yeah. to refer to myself as a wildling, though it is not inaccurate. Um, yeah. So so we are. 
we are out uh, again station identification. Uh, we are Brew Minds. I'm Tom Aguero, Jesse Folks behind the camera. We're here with Andy and Jeff from Fig Leaf here in Middletown, Ohio. Although we're only about 100 feet from Monroe, where I live. Um, and so, yeah, you guys are out here in uh, no man's land um, between uh, Cincinnati. Yeah, no man's land. I live here, but uh, between Cincinnati and Dayton. And so, uh, like, Jesse Tom, was kind Tom of. Is no man. <laughs> right in the fastest county growing in Ohio. Yeah, right in the right. Right. Let's right. be very careful that we're saying no man and not the gnome's land. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll, you'll box him soon enough. Okay. <laughs> we'll resolve this eventually. And um, so, yeah, you're kind of in between both the Cincinnati and Dayton market. And I'm sure people in Cincinnati would say you're not in Cincinnati. People in Dayton would say you're not in Dayton. But what are those two different beer markets like for you guys? Well, I think it's been a little bit different for us um, just from when we started day one. Uh, our sales rep, specifically Derek, was from that. Derek! He had... He had, <laughs> he had uh, mainly worked in that area between, say, the Oregon District, a little bit north of that, and 675, Austin 725, Austin Spring Landing Ohio. area. Uh, so he went up and hit that from day one really hard, just with the accounts that he already knew or had relationships with. Right. So I think from the very beginning, we've had a little bit um, stronger Dayton presence just due to that. Um, well, not, we, we haven't had as much opportunity as to get down into Cincinnati as we'd like. We do have accounts down in that area. Um, but I think just being under a year old, we haven't really kind of gone as far, too much further south than, um, and we've gone down to the banks and Westchester and all that area. But that's like scattershot, not, yeah. right, not right, in a yeah. concerted, but a solidified way. Right. But I think that both, both markets so far have been welcoming when we've been there. So, yeah. So I, I would say, like, do you guys consider yourself a Cincinnati brewery? Do you consider yourself a Dayton brewery, or do you consider yourself a Southwest two? Ohio brewery? Maybe. Yeah, I think since we live on Cincinnati Dayton Road, we're probably both. That's a great answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> we are on Cincinnati Road here, so that's how we see ourselves. But yeah. I mean, if you ask a dozen people, you're going to get a dozen answers. Yep. It all depends on exactly what you consider where. Um, Right, someone in OTR is going to be like, fuck that hillbilly bullshit. <laughs> right. Well, uh, they might, but you know. They will, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, we have both both bus, tour, bus tours from Dayton or Cincinnati have been here, so um, both those routes. So, um, I don't know, we kind of set up shop here just to, because we thought, at least at the time, now we have more breweries around us. However, at the time, we thought that there was a need that needed to be filled in the 6375 corridor area. Uh, for the commuters, um, people one spouse may drive to Cincinnati, the other one may drive to Dayton. That's why I'm uh, out here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, a lot of us live out in this area. So and at that time, uh, we didn't think that there was a uh, you know a brewery feeding that need up in this area. And now you're both so, from this area or around this area, right? Yeah, I grew up over in the in the Lebanon area, one county pretty much my whole life. Uh, Jeff grew up in Trouble County and. Parents worked at AK Steel and let them speak to that. But, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Rebel County, which is just west of Butler County here in Middletown. But like I, I, you know, I've lived most of my adult life in Dayton. I've worked homebrew shops and other breweries, and like I've been, wing. yeah, pretty well uh, acquainted with the Dayton scene for quite a while. And, and so, I mean, if, you, if you're asking us to compare what's it been like, you know, Dayton market versus Cincy market, well. Dayton has been maybe a little more welcoming, but that's probably just due to familiarity, like, you know, relationships. Yeah, yeah. people you have to know. You, you would say it's that over competition, because, I mean, there's 42 brews in Cincinnati, yeah. 43. I don't keep track of Dayton. I think there's 20-ish. And there's only two or three that package. I mean, worked with yeah. Yellow Springs, uh, uh, Dayton Beer Company. Number of breweries is less telling than size of operation and scale of business. Yeah, like very what, true. What very they're true. doing, are they packaging, that sort of thing. So, uh, I mean, you know. A lot of you I said previously, I think that a lot of the Dayton, some, some of the Dayton breweries are smaller, more like right. I mean, tap room sort of. Here, Eudora, those guys are really, really small. They're not distributed at all. I mean, or very. The experience they're offering is for you to come there and drink their beer in exactly. their space. Yes. And that's a different sort of thing than like, oh well. Battery or Ryan guys, where they're in Kroger in Cleveland. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Totally different thing. Well, that that would actually speak to the question that. Um, I want, I want to get in front of you guys is um, 
speaking to like the hipsters in OTR and all the people in Anderson and Cincinnati suburbs, the millennials, like, 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 I, like yourself. yeah, I've been lucky in that I've lived into a, a lot of different Cincinnati communities and I've seen the benefits of all of them. What would you tell the people that it's going to be like 30 or 45 minute drive to get out here to experience a brewery? Like, what is the the number one thing to sell fig leaf on? Why these people should make that drive? Because like I've made it, I think your beers are great. Um, it's definitely a thing that I would recommend people to do. But the the proof is in the pudding. So what what's like the number one thing on the top of my food list, guys? Like why fig leaf? Well, just like you said, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, we have we do a wide variety of styles, and you know, all killer, no filler. Like we we do a lot of Perfect styles, answer. and I'm pretty happy with what we've done so far. I mean, yeah, and we're only we're not even a year old, so that was a good answer. Because because looking at your board here, we've got a cream ale, a English pale ale, an IPA, which you have to have, a hoppy amber. An American Pilsner and a Hazy Tropical IPA, which you also have to have. So, so you go had, from... And we just had two lagers come off this week. So right. The best beer in the Harvest Lager, yeah. So 3.9%. just going to bring that up for people right now so they can see the board. So 3.9%, 4.8, 5.1, up to 9.9. .9. So really, I mean, whatever kind of beer you want to drink... Well, and this is a historically sparse board for us. Right. Uh, we have normally have... Way more than this because you because you just one wanted to distribute with Cavalier and you're saving up for the one year anniversary. That's party. right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And you've got a lot of stuff. You you said earlier that you've got the Ponderous Porter in the tank it, as of today. I think that's my favorite beer from you guys. If you're having to think that hard, that's a good thing. Right. I mean, there's kind of you know, inculpatory the style, but I think I would go back to Ponderous being my absolute favorite. And it did win a silver medal. The same. Right. And that is fantastic in your first year to win a silver medal in competition. That's really good. And that is an excellent way to transition into our next topic, which is talking about like the wealth of styles that you guys have. Right. Like for only being a year old, you guys have done so much in the in the way of trying different things and trying a lot of styles that I would say a lot of breweries would possibly stay Definitely. away from in the first year. That they might be a little afraid to take on. Like doing a tripel and a quad and my favorite are the Cezannes and the Belgian styles. So, I mean, I, hats off to you guys in, in doing all that. And, and, you know, something I think I would like to ask is even more than the Cezannes are becoming pretty popular. Um, quads, unfortunately, not so much. But I'm, I'm curious about the cream ale and the English pale ale, and you guys had a English golden mild, right? Um, what led you to those lighter, different styles instead of hazy, fruity, barrel-aged, kettle sour, adjunct Mexican stouts. There's none of Black nothing wrong with arm adjunct guy. <laughs> There's okay. nothing wrong with all that stuff you just said, and we have done some and will do more of all that. But like uh, from day one, I, I always wanted us to do a, a wide variety of styles, low ABV to high ABV, multi to hoppy, so that basically pretty much anybody could come in and find a style that they liked and gravitated towards. And you know, Variety is the spice of life. What I'm drinking today is likely not to be what I want to have tomorrow. Um, now I return back to favorites. I've got patterns and, you know, whatever. Drink more porter in the, in the fall and the winter, that sort of thing. But uh, I like having the, the freedom of choice to, well, you know, today what kind of sounds good is this or that. And or also if you've had two inculpatories and maybe you need to calm down and have basmati or something. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> the price of the day. <laughs> or if it's, you know... One o'clock in the afternoon, you just got done cutting your grass. You don't necessarily want an imperial stout right then, so that's a good time to have a waste time, right? Yes, absolutely. Funny story, quick aside. Uh, years back, I got up sat on a Saturday morning, went outside, I was mowing the grass, hot, sweaty, came inside, like, oh, I need something. I opened an Aventinas uh, from you know, my fridge. One of my favorite beers of all time. Eight point two percent, I believe, on an empty <laughs> stomach, like, and you know, it's a five hundred mil bottle, like. I went from zero to rocked in very, right. very short order. <laughs> right. um, now I'm curious about, I mean, the the hottest thing in the beer market today are the haze bomb IPAs um, or kettle sours or fruited stuff. Uh, how do the Basmati cream ale and the English mild and the golden, how do they do out in the market? Well, out in the market, the Basmati cream ale, um, just like it's shown in the tap room, is one of our top sellers, uh, along with the Isotrope IPA. Uh, the English Mild did very well for a while. It's a very crushable beer, 3.9%. Uh, um, 
It's a style a lot of people aren't as familiar with, and so there's right. you got this like burden to try to explain what it is to so people. Right? I know IPA. I'll drink the IPA. English Golden what? Somebody yeah, exactly. Well, even that, like you know, your Bud Miller Coors or whoever, um, lighter beer drinker, you can drink a Basmati. They don't even have to understand it, but they get it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Whereas like this gold, tastes familiar. Golden Mild, you might need to explain that in context just a little bit more. It's you know, very low ABV, kind of you know, slightly soft toffee caramel notes. And, you know, it's kind of like, you, you have to do a little more work to explain that beer to people because they don't get it automatically. But now, why do you guys go with these styles instead of, like, a kettle sour? Kettle sour's on the list, we just never got to it. Like, yeah. it was it was planned to be batch number five, but other things happened, and we just haven't circled back around to that. I like that answer. Yeah. So soon. So soon. Hopefully. And probably in the tap moment. A, a raspberry <laughs> kettle sour? Perhaps. <laughs> A quick interjection I would have on that is, um, <laughs> what what are your guys' take on the current, like, what I call a haze craze? Uh, obviously, you have the inculpatory up here, which uh, I've been drinking tonight as mild big haze. Yeah, mild In my yeah. opinion, it's been, well, been great. It's definitely not clear, that's for sure. It doesn't look like orange juice. No, but... Uh, or perhaps a better, better way to put this in there is... So much of craft beer as of late, and there's a lot of local breweries that can be accused of that, is chasing trends. And I, I think this would be the, the final big question I put in before we wrap for the night. But um, where do you guys kind of fall on that? Like, like, obviously you have to do it to some degree to be able to stay relevant, but you also have to be true to yourselves and doing the beers that you guys think that people should have from them. It's a balancing act. You know, I, and I, I think initially... When you're first opening, you don't know exactly how things are going to be perceived. And we had talked previously about how we kind of wanted to do a wide variety of styles and kind of let the market tell us where we should be spending our efforts. Not that you're going to stop making those other stuff. I'm sorry, we're always going to have ponders. It's always going to be on. But if it didn't sell at all, we'd probably it's technically not on right now. Though. Yeah. Yes. We'll, <laughs> we'll always have it in the line. It's in the tanks. It's not like it'll be back. It's not, not, like, we've, it's not, not like, dead. Not like we've given up on it. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, so it's a balancing act. It's also a business. You have to sell beer to be to remain viable. And right. so, uh, you know, whatever. We made a hazy double IPA. But here's my whole. You asked, you know, what well, what do you think about the the, the trend and the craze? Uh, there's a lot of people doing it, but there's a reason for that. And the reason is that we're smack in the middle of a hop renaissance. There are all these new varieties, or you know, a lot, and more coming all the time. By the way, there are yeah. flavor profiles. The, the palette of flavors that you have to work with as a brewer is greater and deeper than it has been ever, and so it only makes sense that now, so for a long time I was quoted, or it could have been quoted as, you know, the haze thing was bullshit, I didn't, I didn't get it, it was, but there are some things I always agreed with, like, oh, an IPA that doesn't have to be like 160,000 IBUs, I'm down with that. Oh, it's, the emphasis is more on the, the, the interesting hop flavors and less on the bitterness, you know, totally on board with that from day one. Does it have to be hazy? Well, that's you're focusing on the wrong variable. Like, I think, in uh, my opinion, Step, a, a stepping off the soapbox. <laughs> no, no, no. Get, get right back on it because I have a direct follow up to that. Would be uh, so you, you're saying that there's a hop renaissance, mm -hmm. which there are so many different varietals. What is a beer that is coming up for fig leaf? Not not part of uh, your anniversary that you think people should start getting excited for. There isn't even a name for it yet. But <laughs> I was, I was say, have you looked beyond your anniversary yet? Is there a beyond the anniversary right now? Like, only, only except for the barrel age stuff. A little bit, a little bit. But like, no, you're right. Getting to anniversary yes. is kind of like more, the entire more focus, right? The kind of blinders, yeah. Like, yeah. But I mean, you know, back to the. I like. I'm very happy with inculpatory in terms of the, the way the fruit expresses, the fruit flavors from the hops and the yeast express themselves. I would like it to be in a smaller package, not a not, I mean, you don't always want to drink a 10% Imperial IPA. I gravitate towards them. lower ABV, maybe I'm getting old, whatever. Uh, I, I agree. So, I love this. I'd like to experiment with more and different hop varieties, of which there are countless, uh, and try to put it in a smaller, you know, more approachable, more, you know, more standard alcohol uh, strength and to make your raspberry kettle sour <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't forget a full uh, raspberry frambois <laughs> you, get all yeah, you that. can throw that out there that's true yeah yeah gotta have that raspberry but 
Close it up for tonight, guys. Uh, if you could quick go over the uh, anniversary details for, for you guys' big party right. and everything. And so, again, I think first anniversary home. party next Fourth Saturday, time. October 14th, 12 yeah. until 12? From 12 to 12. At yeah. least midnight. Yeah. A whole, whole bunch of beers on tap, some old ones, some 18 new ones. 18 beers at least, yeah. and then noon to 10 o'clock, I think, we have bands here yeah. all day. And two different food trucks. Food trucks all day. Carvasas for the win. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, thank you guys for coming on Brew Minds. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you so much for making delicious beer. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>